Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, both those in the room here with us and uh, the many others that we know are joining us online. Uh, my name is Barbara Bass. I have the great privilege of being the Dean of the School of Medicine uh, at George Washington, School of Medicine and Health Sciences, as well as the VP for Health Affairs. I also have the uh, privilege of being the CEO of our faculty clinical practice group, known as the Medical Faculty Associates. Uh, we all together are part of the program, which we define as GW Medicine, Academic Medicine. So medicine informed by education, informed by science, informed by training the next generation, and of course, providing superb uh, patient-centered care in a state-of-the-art uh, fashion by virtue of our wonderful faculty that we will have joining us today. This is the first of uh, several, actually more than a several, a whole year's worth of um, seminars we're gonna be putting on uh, this year to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, many of you may know that a couple of years ago, George Washington University celebrated its bicentennial. Uh, our school was, took a couple of years to get launched after the founding of that uh, great university, and medicine actually was part of one of the programs that was listed in the charter for the George Washington University that was granted by Congress in honor of George Washington back in 1824. So we're really excited to be uh, celebrating our bicentennial year, and we're going to do so with celebrations of our clinical programs, of our research initiatives, of some of our exciting um, educational novel programs that we have that really let us create that next generation of physicians, physician assistants, researchers, scientists, all that. So I hope you'll join us uh, over the course of the year on multiple occasions as we celebrate these moments. George Washington is the 11th oldest medical school um, in, the, uh, in the nation. There are only 10 before us, so we have a long record of uh, distinguished service to the George Washington community and, of course, in national contributions to the advancement of medicine. So today, we're starting this first one, and we're going to focus on heart health. And, of course, many of you may know that uh, February is Heart Health Month. Um, and we have a very distinguished panel of uh, cardiologists uh, who are faculty here at the George Washington University who provide patient care, who do research, who train our physicians, who train our students and our residents. Uh, that whole portfolio of what academic medicine brings to a clinical enterprise. And we're delighted to have this very distinguished group with us. Uh, we're focusing on heart health because it is February Heart Health Month, but also because, as I suspect some of you may know already, heart health, uh, heart disease is a, a pretty common problem in our society. And in fact, it's one of the leading causes of death for both men and women. And the good news in, in that is that actually over the last uh, 40, 50, in fact, two to three years, considerable advances in heart health uh, interventions, therapeutic, diagnostic, continue to happen. And of course, we've also learned a lot more about preventive strategies to protect people from developing heart disease in the first place, which of course is where we really want to be uh, in this arc of uh, understanding this important um, healthcare condition. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our distinguished group. And, and I have a few questions that I'm gonna pitch to each of them, and we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll get some very uh, informative and um, I know I'm gonna learn something today, which is always something I love to do. I don't often have the chance to sit with a group of experts and learn about a field that I'm not in. I'm a surgeon by practice, so, um, but this is really exciting. And we're gonna start with, um, uh, I'll introduce uh, right to left up here, at least my, my right to left, um, our distinguished panelists. First we have here Dr. William Borden, Bill Borden, who is our, uh, currently the interim chair of the Department of Medicine, our largest department here at uh, George Washington University. He's the professor of medicine and uh, health policy, and he also serves as our chief quality and population health officer. So uh, really a broad repertoire of uh, patient-focused and um, um, policy-focused work that he does. He's also, all of these people I'm gonna tell you are cardiologists. They're fabulous cardiologists by practice. Uh, next, I have Dr. Ramesh Mazeri, who's here with us. She's also a professor of medicine. Um, there are not a whole lot of professors of medicine. We have a couple here in our audience that are women, and uh, we're delighted to have you here, uh, Dr. Mazari. Um, she's our director of our interventional cardiology programs. Next, uh, Dr. Mazari, we have Dr. Christian Nagy. 
who's our Associate Professor of Medicine and the Director of our Structural Heart Program. That means the structural elements of your heart, and he'll tell us more about some of the exciting interventions we have um, that have made caring for those structural defects much more patient-friendly. Um, next to him, we have Dr. Andrew Choi. He's an Associate Professor of Medicine and Radiology, and he's the co-director of our Multimodality Cardiac Imaging Program. And boy, if there hasn't been a fascinating uh, explosion of uh, technologies that give us incredible imaging opportunities um, to help us understand this disease so much better. So thank you, Dr. Choi. And next to him, we have Dr. Cynthia Tracy, another woman who happens to be a professor of medicine as well, and she's the director of our Division of Cardiology here at GW. Um, and she has great deep expertise in electrophysiologic conditions of the heart, which she's gonna to talk to us about a little bit. And last down there on the end is Dr. Garusha Pandra, who's a, also a professor of medicine, and he's the director of our Advanced Heart Failure Program, which you hope, we hope you don't need, but Sometimes you might, so we're, we're glad to have you with us to share the, your expertise and advances in, in managing and preventing those important conditions. So with that, let's get started, okay? Um, uh, Dr. Borden, let's start with you, because I think one of the things we all want to hope for is that we can actually understand our own risks for heart disease. And, um, and in understanding those, maybe we can have some interventions that will let us um, uh, avoid some progression of our heart disease, which we, we Americans are so likely to develop. Um, so let's start with that. Let's start with just kind of a general description of the important risk factors that we know for heart disease. And secondarily, maybe you could talk about some of the strategies we might use to uh, support uh, support our own preparation for dealing with those risk factors. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Bass, and thank you all for being here today. Um, you know, one of the things that um, really drew me as a physician to cardiology was all that we could do to help people. Um, we have a tremendous set of tools of working with patients to, to not only treat disease when it exists, but really to prevent it. And that's what I do as a preventive cardiologist. Um, and so uh, in thinking about that, we think about cardiovascular disease um, more broadly. And so this includes things like coronary artery disease or heart attacks, strokes, peripheral artery disease. And we think about them together because the risk factors are the same that drive towards these events. And these are risk factors, we know what they are and we know what we can do to prevent uh, these events from happening. And um, so one of the, the ways to think about this that the American Heart Association developed that I really like is called Life's Simple Seven. And so that is uh, don't smoke, eat right, exercise, lose weight if you need to, control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol, and control your blood sugar, meaning diabetes. And so you know, focusing on those elements if you do all of that, and I sometimes add in there when I talk to my patients, stress reduction, things like exercise, yoga, meditation, um, you're really covering the landscape of preventing cardiovascular disease. So um, how do you approach this? One is to know your numbers. So know your body mass index, which is a measure of your weight, looking for obesity. Know your blood pressure, know your cholesterol, and know your blood sugar, looking for diabetes. Um, once you have those components, um, you talk with the doctor, there may be other risk factors like family history and others, um, but with that, then you can really take steps to reduce your risk. Great. I know um, one of the things that we, that you, you mentioned cholesterol, and I wonder if you might speak a little bit about uh, how often do you check your cholesterol? What's a, what is this thing about good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, HDL, LDL, all these things? It's a a soup that often has changing, changing guidance around it. Can you speak a little bit about how best to get in sync with managing your cholesterol? Absolutely. Um, you know, the cholesterol going back to the Framingham Heart Study in the late 1940s is when you know we first learned that cholesterol is a major driver of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, when you look at all the different elements you can control to reduce your risk. Reducing cholesterol has the biggest impact on shrinking plaque size and, and preventing these events. Um, so 
what we typically get, you get your total cholesterol, which is a sum of the, the different parts added up, the triglycerides, which is very responsive to your blood sugar, and if someone is diabetic and their blood sugar is high, that can be high, and it improves quite a bit with diet and exercise. HDL, which is considered the good cholesterol, helps to protect against heart disease. And then the one that we really focus on is called the LDL cholesterol. And that's the one that we really target to prevent heart disease. I do want to mention one other type of cholesterol, which has really um, gotten a lot of research behind it in recent years, something called the lipoprotein A, which is kind of a particularly bad form of that LDL. Um, it's genetically inherited and does put people at risk for heart disease, particularly if you have a strong family history. That's one of the things we often test for, and um, particularly if you have a strong family history, I would suggest getting tested for as well. There we go, great. And I guess the bottom line is talk to your cardiologist or talk to your primary care physician and make sure you've got a strategy for addressing and monitoring this important element, correct? That's right. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to Dr. Panjrath, um, because I think the next thing we want to, is we sort of stay in this preventive mode, um, let's talk about what particular parts of prevention that anybody can do even without the help of their, of their physician necessarily. Things like diet, exercise, how do, you, how do you advise people on how to do that? Are there any particular patterns we should observe? Thank you. That's a, that's a very important aspect of uh, the uh, preventive part is diet and exercise. And, you know, just in continuation of what Dr. Borden talked about, the cholesterol and overall, you know, the, the simple seven and then the stress reduction, then comes uh, part of that is diet as well. And, you know, diet has had a long connection with chronic diseases, with overall health. And we know that. In fact, we know that majority of Americans know it, and unfortunately, only 90% of, of us, uh, you know, or 10% of us actually follow that. 90% uh, of us of, are still lacking in the proper uh, nutritional health, uh, I would call it. Now, what does that really mean? It really means, like, you know, eating the right things, uh, because when you look at the global picture, it does add on to risk for chronic diseases, not only heart health, obviously we are talking about heart health here, and uh, this is the uh, February being a heart health month, but it also you know, uh, has impact on cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, among other disorders, colon cancer. So there's so many other diseases or chronic diseases which nutrition has a role in, and, and we don't do a very good job, even though it can be very simple. So, so what is recommended for that? You know, AHA has been, uh, our American Heart Association has been focused on this, and in, all the way back in 1961, they started giving these recommendations. And, and the current recommendations are very simple. You know, these are recommendations which you can incorporate into your own family traditions, in your cultural traditions, wherever, you know, your values may be. So instead of focusing on food groups, they have been like, you know, they have made it more simple. Now, let me go a little more into detail on what that really means. The things are to incorporate into your daily diet, things such as more fruit and vegetables. Simple concept, fruit and vegetables, a certain amount of servings every day. Instead of saying, okay, how many calories and how much, because everybody's requirement may be different. What I may need for my body and my activity level may be different than somebody else's. But ideally, you know, a couple of servings of fruit and vegetables, and that's key. Whole grains, focus on whole grains, moving away from uh, processed foods, refined uh, flours, as much as you can incorporate. Again, you know, it may not be possible for everyone to incorporate all of them at the same time into your daily plan, but the more you do, the better the results are. Then things such as lean meats uh, or lean protein, to be, and, and the primary focus should be more on plant-based protein, uh, things such as legumes, beans, uh, those are really useful and good rich sources of protein. Uh, but if you, you know, wanted to, you could uh, get in more lean meat, lean protein, such as fish, poultry, uh, among others. 
And then uh, you go on to dairy and you know, uh, more kind of low fat or fat free dairy as well. And, and so when you incorporate all these together, these food compo uh, co components into your diet, that just leads on to a healthy diet. Now you can go into more details on how many servings, you know, there are very specific recommendations on that, you know, of each uh, of these uh, food groups, uh, and you can incorporate that into your meal plan as well. Mm -hmm. But key thing is, you know, keeping it simple, going back to the basics, looking at, you don't have to go read every calorie on every component, then we get really bogged down in details and we start failing and we fail to achieve that goal. Uh, uh, keeping a good moderate uh, uh, amount of mix of all these things. And I just might add one thing that we have that's sort of special at the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences is a program in culinary medicine. Um, and in fact, we have a teaching kitchen over on uh, K Street where we send our students, our residents, and even occasionally a faculty member or two to really learn how to prepare heart healthy and otherwise healthy foods. Uh, it, I can assure you, when I was a student in uh, medical school some many, many decades ago, uh, we didn't talk a lot about health and diet. We, we said don't, get, don't weigh too much, but that was about it. And I think it's really come a long way and I'm really proud of the curriculum that we have that's been developed by Tim Harlan to address those things. And, and we are making that available as well to our patients uh, in our primary care uh, clinics as well. So the more we build that concept of food as health into our regular routines of taking care of our patients, I think the, the more exciting an impact we can have. I wonder if you could um, say something about exercise too, because yeah. you know, like how much do you really have to do? Is some better than others? What, what do we yeah. really need to know about exercise? Because yeah, everybody uh, says they will, but then, yeah? Yeah, no, that's another uh, important aspect of life is exercise, and, or I would say activity of any kind to begin with. You know? And even though there are very uh, specific recommendations, and I'll go that into detail a little bit, but I would say start with just moving. You know, uh, if you are sedentary, get up and move. You know, all of our lives, we are spent so much time, especially the pandemic, we have got into this habit. We are stuck to our screens, uh, you know, whether it be the big screen or the small screen, and we spend so much time in front of them. And to just get up and move, just stand up. You know, actually I have Dr. Tracy, who is an uh, uh, electrophysiologist who stands right next to me in my office in our clinic, and she stands up and does her work. And I um, always admire that because that just improves your activity level. So you know, do whatever you can, whichever level you are, try to increase that more. Uh, then going beyond those uh, states, if you're really now going into the nitty gritties of how much time is, ex is recommended, AHA again has very specific recommendations. The recommendation for overall kind of cardiovascular health and well-being is 150 minutes of moderate exercise or moderate activity over a course of a week you can distribute it over a course of five days. If you go on to the next level, which is vigorous active activity, and I'll, I can give you a few examples of what that really means, that's 75 minutes per week, and you can sep spread it out. The better results are when you spread it out, but if you kind of put them all in one day, it's still good. Uh, so 75 minutes of uh, moderate to s vigorous activity over five days, or 150 minutes of moderate activity. You also want to include some strength training in there, uh, and that's important. So you want to have a mix of aerobic activity as well as strength training. Now, if you go to the next level, you say, I want to use exercise to reduce my blood pressure and my cholesterol, then you have to kind of in in increase it even further. That means 40 minutes of uh, uh, vigorous, and I say vigorous activity three to four times a week. So that's kind of the, the overall health prescription for exercise or exercise prescription for health, you can call it. Um, but again, it comes down to being uh, you know, active. Now, what is moderate activity? Simple things, walking. Uh, you know, if you are gardening, if you are uh, you know, uh, uh, aerobic uh, walk, um, activity in the swimming pool, or water aerobics, these are examples of moderate activity. How about vigorous? If you start jogging, if you are cycling at 10 miles an hour, uh, if you are digging you know, uh, in your ground or shoveling snow, all those examples of 
uh, vigorous activity. So a lot of things which we are able to incorporate pretty easily. And I, again, say keep it simple. You know, if you drive a car, you park a car, try to park it a little away from wherever you're going. So that will push, incorporate that activity into your lifestyle. So every little bit helps. Yes. Yes. There's nothing, no, you can't have too much, but you also can't have too little. That's great. All right, well, thank you very much. Let's move on to Dr. Mazzari. And uh, because I think we all hear in the media that uh, women are or disadvantaged when it comes to both recognizing heart disease, perhaps even seeking or receiving treatment for heart disease. Um, and I wonder if you might um, speak to us a little bit about that and, and maybe start with, again, key risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women. Are they just the same or something different? Of course. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to talk about cardiovascular disease in women, the number one cause of mortality in women, which a lot of us don't know. I think the general um, uh, understanding is that breast cancer is the number one killer, but that is simply not accurate. A third of all deaths in women is caused by cardiovascular disease. Um, the other alarming um, um, statistics is that more women are dying from cardiovascular disease under the age of 50. So the mortality from cardiovascular disease in younger women is on the rise. And some of that has to do with the knowledge gap of the patient, knowledge gap of the physicians. Uh, early symptoms of heart attack are not easily recognized by the patients or their caregivers. Um, there is this um, uh, definition of uh, Hollywood heart attack. I don't know if you've seen that in the media, but the typical crushing chest pain, um, we only see that in a third of female patients presenting with um, a coronary event. Um, it's not unusual for women to present with um, chest tightness, heartburn, indigestion, sometimes just shortness of breath, fatigue, arm pain, jaw pain. But especially in younger women, uh, these symptoms are under-recognized. So there is delayed presentation because there's not enough awareness among women that these could be the signs of heart attack. And there is delayed treatment because uh, there is knowledge gap uh, among physicians in terms of early recognition and offering aggressive treatments. Um, now, why is it that younger women are at risk? Uh, the research in the last 30 years that have been very much gender focused or sex specific has shown that the traditional risk factors that we all know about, high blood pressure, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, um, the risk factors for women go beyond these traditional risk factors. We have learned that, for example, what happens during pregnancy determines the risk of the woman for the cardiovascular disease for the decades to come. So during my training, we were not trained to really get a good history of uh, women's um, uh, pregnancy history. Did they develop high blood pressure? Were they diabetic during the uh, pregnancy, preterm labor? They all really augment the risk of cardiovascular disease in the years to come. Um, we have also learned that early menopause, polycystic ovary syndrome, all these common conditions can actually augment the risk. So what we're doing now, what the guidelines recommend is to really have a broader way of looking at risk assessment when it comes to women. Uh, we call these now risk enhancers in the guidelines. So the um, preterm, uh, early menopause, um, <coughs> pregnancy-induced hypertension, polycystic ovary disease, autoimmune diseases, they all augment the risk, which then means that the physicians would be a lot more aggressive in terms of modifying the risk factors. And the physicians in the emergency room looking at a 45-year-old woman don't dismiss the possibility of uh, an acute um, uh, coronary event. Um, and the hope is that in the um, near future, we will have ways of also incorporating social determinants of health into the risk stratification, which we're learning um, over and over that it, it matters where the patients live and what kind of socioeconomic classes they're coming from. So I think that the uh, revolution in terms of risk assessment is that we are going way beyond the traditional risk factors that we've always talked about. Yeah. Very, that's really important to know. And, and I guess most patients would probably have this risk assessment done by their primary care physicians. By the time they get to you, they know they have heart disease or mm -hmm. are suspected of having heart disease. How, what, how are you inter intersecting with our primary care physicians at, at GW Medicine, for example, to ensure 
that we are on top of this at all times in all domains? I think um, increasing awareness among patients and the physicians. And when we say physicians, we're not just referring to cardiologists. That includes primary care physician, OBGYN, everybody who comes into contact with uh, taking care of women, especially a lot of focus should be shifted towards women in reproductive uh, age, the ones that we never thought would be at risk. Now we're paying a lot more attention to their risk profile before they have events. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Well, let's move on to uh, some of the more uh, technologically uh, interventional driven kind of uh, um, advances in heart disease in the last little, uh, uh, last few years, really, last 10 years especially. And, and for that, we're gonna look to Dr. Nagy um, to speak to us, who, who leads our structural health program, structural heart program, and tell us about some of the newer advances in interventional cardiology, especially, for example, in valve replacement, um, that have changed the landscape for patients that used to have major, 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 major surgery. Huh? Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for having me here. So we've heard a lot about uh, prevention and. Um, like a, a car or a house, uh, sometimes things break down and they can break down inside the heart as well. And there's different things that can break down inside the heart and that's where we are here to, to repair them when they do. Um, one uh, particular uh, topic for today that we focus on is um, what if the, the heart valves break? Um, you know, and the most important valve, you know, the heart has four valves that. Uh, make sure that the flow, the blood flow goes only into one direction. Um, and uh, one of the most important valves is, uh, sits between the heart and the body. And that is called the aortic valve. So um, with time, uh, there's wear and tear, and that aortic valve can break. Um, and it breaks in a form that it degenerates. And it degenerates because there's calcium deposits um, that accumulate over time and inflammation and that leads to a narrowing of the valve. And when the valve narrows, um, fortunately it's a mechanical problem and there's not, you know, no good medication that can reverse that. So we have to replace the valve. Uh, traditionally we have um, had um, open heart surgery for, for a long period of time. Um, that is a very good uh, therapy. Uh, but fortunately, over the last decade, um, there's a second alternative therapy that emerged, and that is replacing the heart valve without open heart surgery. Um, that is called TAVR, uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And uh, TAVR was approved uh, just over 10 years ago in the United States, and since then um, has essentially uh, become, you know, an equal therapy to open heart surgery. And uh, we always looked at uh, heart surgery, you know, like, like the bigger brother, if you want, um, and compared, you know, the TAVR to the open heart surgery. And over time, you know, the little brother grew up and uh, now it's, uh, you know, equal, equal to the big brother. So what we do um, in a procedure that, you know, lasts about an hour, more or less, uh, we place a catheter through the groin vessel, go up inside the heart and place another valve inside the existing valve. And most patients go home the next day. And if you compare that to um, open heart surgery, you know, that is a major shift in, in therapy. Is TAVR for everyone that has aortic valvular stenosis? <laughs> So one would think, but TAVR is actually not for everybody. Um, we have a very comprehensive um, you know, team at GW uh, made of uh, cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons. And so when somebody comes with uh, aortic stenosis with a narrow uh, aortic valve, then we assess everybody uh, individually uh, to see which therapy is the best. Um, but TAVR has become a lot more available and of course, um, you know, who wants open heart surgery? Uh, so it's, um, at, at the moment, uh, there's more patients being treated with TAVR than, than open heart surgery. But there are situations where open heart surgery still is better. Um, so this sounds sort of like the same transformation that occurred from open coronary artery bypass grafting to the percutaneous interventions. Is that, is that the case? 
More or less, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the acceptance has also changed and uh, the knowledge, um, you know, in the physician population, uh, the surgeons have shifted a little bit and we work together and so, um, you know, there's always the, the best approach is a, is a team approach. Um, but we have both of them here and it's, uh, we have very good care at GW uh, and we continue to, to provide that. I imagine there's a substantial difference in recovery after this procedure relative to the open procedures? Absolutely. So there is many advantages that a, a TAVR procedure brings. Um, first of all, it's not open heart surgery. Uh, there's no pain. Um, you know, somebody recovering from surgery um, has, you know, a significant amount of, of pain. Um, and then uh, just mobility. Um, we tell our patients that you come, we'll replace your valve, and the next day, dinner is at home. And uh, with open heart surgery, you have to stay in the hospital, recover for like a week, uh, more or less, and then it takes another two, three months to, you know, fully recover. Uh, so while open heart, our tower was initially approved in a higher risk population because we didn't know how it's gonna fare, um, it has done very well. And now the bar has lowered and uh, the approval has sort of expanded to anybody. So anybody can have a TAVR, even the lowest risk uh, patients. And this has made things a lot more attractive for people who still work. Um, you know, they, they can't, they don't want to or can't afford to, to be away or be off work. Uh, for too long, so um, you know, one of the major advantages is that you can get back to um, you know your well-being a, a lot quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. It does seem like after these kind of procedures, where you have maybe some muscular or structural damage to your heart or other um, areas, for example, in yours, Dr. Panjroth, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, cardiac rehabilitation and the role that that plays in recovering after these? kind of procedures or even more generally in patients who have more advanced heart disease? Do we have that capacity here at GW? So uh, no, cardiac rehab is an important component and this is after most of the procedures such as uh, uh, bypass surgery, TAVR, uh, for all patients with heart failure and also for blockages in the legs with peripheral arterial disease. So this is a procedure which is basically, this is a therapy which is involved, exercise therapy and it's a comprehensive program is not only uh, you work with specialists for exercise uh, or aerobic activity, but they also guidance on nutrition and other aspects of care as well. And, and it has been shown to be very beneficial across uh, different disease conditions. Uh, I'm a heart failure specialist for across the whole spectrum, and this is not only advanced heart failure, heart failure being one of the most common conditions and one of the most common reasons for somebody being in the hospital. So a lot of population uh, uh, has heart failure or different types, and they all benefit from cardiac rehab. So it's an, it's an amazing therapy, very underutilized part of it is because of uh, unrecognition of the benefits and availability. Now there's different components of it at components at our medical center level and also at the policy level because uh, there's a drive at the policy level to make it more approachable, more easily deliverable because there are some limitations on delivery of care uh, around rehab. And we have with our, uh, we have aspects of it here at GW and we also are at our, uh, hopefully with our new center uh, in, at Cedar Hill, we'll have even more comprehensive uh, offerings out there. Yeah, so it really is that full spectrum of uh, supporting heart health that we really uh, can offer and it's, it's really terrific. All right, Dr. Tracy, let's move on to you because I think every time you turn on the TV, if you do, you'll see something about AFib or something else. Um, but Dr. Tracy is our resident expert in heart arrhythmias and uh, therapies for um, and types of interventions that we have to treat these conditions, particularly the interventional piece, which I guess we might talk about more today. Um, so could you just give us a brief thumbnail sketch on what is an arrhythmia and what are the tools that we have to address it? And, and then get into some of the interventional strategies that you use. Certainly. Um, I have the opportunity and the privilege of sort of sitting in the middle of all of these different colleagues of mine because all of them feed to me, people who end up having heart rhythm disturbances. 
so you could have a heart rhythm disturbance as a result of having a heart attack or of having valvular heart disease. Um, an arrhythmia just means that your heart is not beating for some reason or another in the organized fashion that it, that it was intended to be. Uh, some of these arrhythmias are very, very benign, and part of my job is distinguishing who is this, who is having a heart rhythm problem that is benign versus somebody who is having a heart rhythm problem that really needs to be treated and really could pose some type of threat to the person. Uh, and that really has been a, a body of knowledge that we have gained over the last decades, looking at uh, does a weak heart, is that more likely to have problems with serious heart rhythm problems? Is a valvular heart disease, is that somebody likely to have a problem? Or is a healthy 20-year-old who feels palpitations, is that dangerous? So we have great guidance and great guidelines to tell us who we really need to double down on and make sure that we have their abnormal rhythms under control. Most of Dr. Pandrath and I, we sit together in clinic or stand together in clinic because our uh, sectors really interact quite a bit. People who do have weak hearts are at risk for having very serious types of heart rhythm disturbances. And then we have a number of different interventions that we can do for people with arrhythmias. The healthy 20, 25, 30-year-old who's exercising and develops palpitations, it depends. It depends if it's something where there's a sustained type of abnormal heart rhythm. Is that something that we need to intervene on? Um, and those interventions can range from device implantations to catheter ablation procedures uh, to simply just reassurance that this is not something that is dangerous for you. We don't really need to uh, treat this very aggressively. So it's a full spectrum of uh, treatment options and uh, stratification that we go through. Yeah, I think it is. Oh, it's really fascinating. Um, the way the heart is sort of this little electric, electrical grid, right? It's got these little right. wonderful uh, electrical map all over the place. And for you to do your work, you have to understand that that map and those pathways. And uh, and it really is a map. How, can you tell us anything about how you actually do that on a Absolutely. Real That's one of, one of my favorite things. So back uh, many years ago when I started out in medical school, I went to a lecture that an electrophysiologist, my specialty, gave, and I thought, this guy's nuts. Uh, he is sitting in a dark room, turning, you know, stimulating hearts into potentially lethal arrhythmias and then shocking people out of them. And back then that was about all that could be done. Uh, now we have the ability to map the electrical activation in the heart to exactly see how the electricity is traveling from one position to another. We do have very complex electrophysiologic um, uh, principles that we look at. We look at refractory periods. We look at speed of conduction. We look at a lot of different things. And over the years that I've been doing this, we have taken these principles and turned them into some very practical mapping tools. Uh, so for example, in one of the rhythms that I very commonly ablate is atrial fibrillation. And I have the capacity to join with my colleague, Dr. Choi, who will create for me the anatomic map of the heart with a CT scan, which I will then import into my three-dimensional mapping system. I will then place catheters into the heart that allow me to collect thousands of positions, thousands of electrical recordings over a period of just a matter of seconds. I can then merge that with the image that Dr. Choi has provided for me ahead of time. And then I can spin the patient around upside down, face down, up down, in the room, sort of virtually by rotating these maps. I'm then able to place my catheters into the uh, positions as these arrhythmias are occurring. And if you envision what a um, weather map looks like, you can see the storm coming across. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the storms in your heart that are occurring. And then I can find the focus that's starting it, or I can find the area where the arrhythmia is vulnerable. And then with catheters, special catheters or special balloons, I can target those areas and basically eliminate the ability of that electrical activity to be generated from that tissue. So it's gone from starters and stoppers, which is what I called it when I was in med school. I'm like, these people are nuts, but of course I followed them, uh, to people who can intervene based on very complex mapping systems with very uh, integrated tools that I rely on all of these guys to, to provide me with. Yeah, it really has been an exciting uh, transformation. Um, I, one thing that, um, that we all wonder, but some arrhythmias are more amenable to this kind of intervention than others. Can you sort of speak to the, the category? Because everybody 
you know, there's many different varieties there. So. Sure. There, now, we, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say we cannot treat, we cannot fix everything. That would be a wild overstatement. Uh, so a lot of the times we're, we're modifying or modulating things. Uh, things that are very um, mappable are things that come from a specific focus, a specific area. And with these 3D mapping systems, we're able to pin it down and find the exact origin or circuits that we can find, that we know this is the vulnerable spot in this circuit, those are easy to interrupt. There are other conditions where the, the disease process of the heart has been so extensive that you can't interrupt it and, uh, or completely fix it. What you might be doing is trying to modify or reduce the, the risk or reduce the frequency of events. So, the, so what we can intervene on a lot will depend on the severity of the underlying heart condition. Yeah, very good. So often in complement to medications, Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for some conditions, like uh, the young healthy athlete who happens to have one of these reentrant circuits, if we're successful, which we are for treating that particular type of arrhythmia, 98% of 99% of the time, they're not going to need any medications after, the, after we're completed the procedure. For other conditions, one of Dr. Pandreth's patients who may have, were treating sort of modifying the amount of ventricular tachycardia that they may be experiencing, they will be on medications after the procedure is done. So it, it is, we, we try to, our, our ideal is to not require medication, but it, it depends on the underlying substrate, what you can and cannot accomplish. Of course, of course, yeah, very good. Thank you so much. Well, this sort of sets it up nicely for Dr. Choi, who kind of is our, uh, uh, really state-of-the-art imaging, uh, technology-enabled, uh, and uh, AI-informed kind of uh, physician here on the, de on the table, uh, at the, the panel up here. And I wonder if you could just, uh, just start by kind of generally discussing where, where do you see AI, a word we hear is applied to a bazillion things, applied here to the, the discipline of cardiology. Well, thank you, Dean Bass. And before we talk about AI, just to also acknowledge, I'm really inspired by all of my colleagues and the panelists. You know, I think a lot of the simple things that we talk about are, are so applicable to uh, our heart health and really underlie what we're trying to accomplish now as a field when it comes to artificial intelligence. You know, if I think broadly, you know, AI is in the news. Uh, it is across media. It is something that we've been talking about in a very broad way. And it really incorporates every part of our everyday life now. Uh, how many people in the audience use Amazon uh, for shopping? Or how many people have an Apple iPhone that has facial recognition? Or have been thinking about a self-driving car? Uh, AI technologies pervade uh, uh, across society, um, but when it comes to medicine, the uptake has been more measured. And when we think about it in cardiovascular medicine, uh, we're looking for ways that we can mimic uh, and really translate the type of expert clinicians that you are hearing from here on the stage and to make that uh, broadly accessible to people, to apply the knowledge that already exists and to put it in places in which uh, these cardiovascular advances may not be readily accessible. Uh, a couple of examples that I'll share with you. Um, in arrhythmias, for example, the number of folks in the audience that have an Apple Watch that have arrhythmia detection or atrial fibrillation detection is uh, through uh, underlying AI and machine learned algorithms. In cardiac imaging and diagnostics, um, in which there are over 500 FDA-approved uh, imaging approaches already um, that allow for leveraging very, very large amounts of data, um, uh, 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 billions upon billions of, of data on an individual image basis that we may be trying to read every day to be able to automate the diagnosis, to be able to make the diagnosis reproducible, to be able to predict based on the imaging that we're seeing in the heart imaging whether it's using ultrasound imaging, CT imaging, MRI imaging, to be able to predict a patient's risk of developing heart failures, Dr. Pandreth takes care of, or predicting the risk of a heart attack. Um, there are uh, AI-based technologies that use big data, so the electronic medical record, uh, leveraging the knowledge that we have across millions or tens of millions of patients and the experience that we have on a national and international scope so that we can better enhance our ability to predict risk, predict a patient's likelihood of developing heart disease, developing a heart attack, and to be able to target our interventions and preventions appropriately for those patients. There are 
many caveats that we have to consider for artificial intelligence and cardiovascular health. Uh, one is really thinking about uh, the privacy concerns that underlie everything that we do in medicine, uh, how we apply HIPAA, how do we uh, think about who owns this data? If we're leveraging a large imaging study or if we're leveraging a large EMR, does this data belong to the patient? Does it belong to the healthcare system? Does it belong to uh, the, uh, the groups that are leveraging the AI technology? And how do we ensure that these privacy needs are met in an appropriate and safe way? Uh, second important question comes to safety. Uh, it uh, may not be so uh, bad if the AI gets your preference wrong on Amazon because you can correctly fix it. If we're asking our artificial intelligence to pick the right patient for ablation or pick the right patient for a transcatheter aortic valve um, and do that modeling uh, without human input, if the AI gets it wrong, then who becomes responsible? It, does the responsibility lie with the technology? Does it lie with the physician that's underlying the technology? Um, or does it lie, uh, uh, underlie with the company that's developed the com uh, technology or the academic institution that's developed the com uh, technology? When you look at what the FDA has said about this, the FDA has said that these AI tools, these AI imaging and cardiovascular imaging-based tools are considered clinical decision support. Um, that it does require that there's human input behind it um, so that if an AI uh, does, a, say, a full three-dimensional model of the heart, does all of the segmentation of the heart, does all of the analysis of the plaque and the plaque burden, that there is human input behind it um, so that that information goes back to the clinician to be able to decide what to do with it between the clinician and the patient. I think the third important point I'll bring up with AI in cardiovascular medicine and in medicine in general is that of empathy. You know, what we experience as patients when we talk to our physician directly in the room, in the clinical setting, what it means for the physician to really walk you through what it means to live a healthy lifestyle, what it means to approach the heart attack that you have suffered or that your family member has suffered, and how to really be able to empathize and really walk with you in this time of need. Um, what the AI is, uh, where this has really gotten interest is through large language models, or chat GPT that has been developed by companies. The ability for a computer to take uh, data and output something that uh, mimics what a human would do. So I can ask my AI, or I can ask chat GPT, Will you create a limerick uh, around a heart disease in the style of U2, the band? And the chat GPT is going to output that for you, and it'll, be, it'll actually be pretty good, or create a graphical input. Um, what the chat GPT or the uh, 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 large language model may not be able to do, and really doesn't do very well, is to be on the level of empathy that a Dr. Pandreth a Dr. Board and a, do a Dean Bass can have and achieve uh, in uh, a way that's been developed through decades of their experience. Uh, one of the really uh, 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 great experts on this campus right now that we are starting to develop some early collaborations on this is Dr. Rebecca Hua. Uh, she's the Chair of Computer Science at, at GW School of Engineering Applied Sciences and has been really thinking about LLMs for the last 20 years uh, before coming to GW and being, uh, receiving this appointment. And we're excited for some of the ways uh, that, um, that we'll look in the future uh, across GW medicine, across cardiovascular medicine, and with engineering, uh, and, and where this takes us uh, to develop AI further. Thank you, Dr. Choi. You know, and I think it is really, ex you know, these waves of really disruptive innovation that come along in healthcare. They're really exciting, you know, and I think we had, uh, you know, and we can look back to the 19th century, the anesthesia, that was a big one, you know, when you could put somebody to sleep and comfortably operate them, uh, or vaccines, or antibiotics, but really AI is gonna be one of those. It's really gonna change our understanding of disease and our opportunities to intervene. And, and I'm just glad you brought it back to the human side of it, which is actually what draws, I'm sure, everybody on this table to become a physician, myself included. And it is that very human experience and that great privilege we have in caring for each other and for those who are vulnerable, keeping them well, 
helping them when, uh, and whenever we can. So we, we're, we're gonna keep pushing to make sure that AI maintains its humanity. And, and it's really gonna be the responsibility of us and our patients to do so. So I uh, really appreciate you bringing that sentiment here to this. Well, I think that wraps up our our, our symposium this morning, and I really thank you all for joining us. Um, we are going to tell you, if you have questions, maybe a couple of our faculty could stand around for a little bit, um, but uh, we also will, if you have specific questions, we can also refer you to our, uh, our physicians, and I think we're going to put the, the site up there on the screen in terms of where, uh, how to reach out to us at the uh, GW Docs and GW Medicine, if we can provide any further um, care to you or information. Uh, but we also hope that you'll join us in about two months uh, on April 18th when we're going to have another group of our uh, distinguished faculty talk to us about brain health. So um, another one of those exciting domains where, boy, what we're learning about the brain and applying it to uh, healthcare is just on the cusp of uh, what it's going to be 20, 30 years from now. So I hope you'll join us for that as well. Thank you so much for being here. Right. Okay. I, yeah, you know, I guess, do we have a minute for a question? We have a minute or two. Okay. Do you want to? Okay. The question is about what is the, uh, oh. the risk or the benefit of calcium supplements um, in patients with potential cardiovascular disease? Yeah, it's an excellent question and something that has come up from time to time. Um, so the underlying basis is that we know that when you develop plaque within the heart, uh, when it becomes stable, um, that the plaque may have an overlying uh, calcified element to it. Um, this has been studied uh, very, uh, in a very uh, uh, longitudinal, long way, and that there, uh, the taking a calcium supplement to help with your bone health um, does not contribute to the development at all of calcified plaque, and we would, uh, I would very strongly encourage to continue uh, with that supplement for that purpose. Okay, again, oh, oh, we do have some questions. You want to, you okay for this? Everybody okay for this? I'm okay with it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. I, I have a question regarding the exercise area. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about living longer, but living healthy. You know, who wants to live to be 100 if, you know, you can't enjoy it? So there's been a book called Outlive. I think it's by Peter Atia. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. And the recommendation is to exercise two hours a day. And so I'm telling you, I'm... I've grown up exercising, et cetera, but two hours, you'd really have to have the time. But my husband's taking this quite seriously, so <laughs> he will get up, exercise an hour in the morning, and then again in the evening, another hour. So I'm just kind of looking for your advice as to whether you think this is, you know, something important to do these two hours, and if you've heard of it. Yeah, no, that, that's a, uh, you're right. That book has been under, you know, uh, a lot of uh, attention or uh, media attention as well. And, you know, it goes back, so it's, it's fascinating. If you really look at, uh, if you look at what's recommended for kids, age 6 to 17, it's three hours of moderate to vigorous activity, exercise. And as we go through our life cycle and we age, Obviously, some of the recommendations are based on evidence to say they have a benefit, but it's also being realistic. So this is, goes back to what I was saying. For, for somebody, they may have two hours. I'll be honest, I will never have two hours. I probably may be at 95, I may have two hours. Yeah. But if you have it and have the time and you, know, you can incorporate, and then again, it also matters how you incorporate the two hours, what kind of activity, right? I gave you a, cert, a few examples of those activities. Walking is one, you know, moving around is one. Now, does it have to be vigorous two hours every day? Majority, I'll be honest with you, you know, if we put recommendations like that, it's very difficult to follow those. And so that's why it becomes coming back to simple things matter. Practical, 
advice which people, majority of the people can follow. Now for everybody, it may vary a little bit. And this again, same thing what I said for diet too. There are certain recommendations, but like it may be different. For if I go exercise two hours, my requirement of what I am gonna eat or drink is gonna be very different than from somebody else who may not exercise at all. So there is a level of flexibility built into all these things. So we cannot be as prescriptive for everything. Uh, but generally, the more active you are, the better it is. And, and part of it is strength training. So when you talk about longevity and you know a lot of things, when, other than the heart month and dying from heart disease, a lot of times as you age, what happens is falls happen you break bones. And that's where this uh, strength training really becomes useful as well on top of cardiovascular health. So again, I will shy away from commenting on whether two hours is the best thing or not, but I would say tailor it to your own lifestyle and do as much as you can and incorporate different components, aerobic and resistance training in there. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question. I see one more hand here and then we'll... Here, let's, um, let's get you the microphone so others can hear it. Here it comes. Uh, Dr. Messari mentioned uh, autoimmune diseases, and I was wondering if someone who has type 1 diabetes, for example, is at higher risk for cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular disease later in life? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's one of the known and the most traditional risk factors for coronary disease. But in general, autoimmune disease in men and women um, represents a, an overall um, um, inflammatory state, which we know is the key risk factor for developing atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, so the answer is yes. Thank so, you. I appreciate so, so careful management, attention to really stringent management, I guess, is a very important exactly. aspect of risk reduction. Yes. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, I want to once again thank our distinguished panel for sharing their expertise, their time, and uh, thank our audience for being a, an attentive and interested audience and those on on the web up there, same to you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing, I hope, some of you in April when we discuss brain health. Thank you for being here.